honor to introduce you, uh, Mr. Schneider. Um, in fact, I heard about him for a long, long time. Uh, so, um, I, uh, uh, once I heard this uh, uh, event, I uh, volunteered to uh, join this, uh, participate in this event. Mr. Schneider, uh, for the past three, two decades, <laughs> are uh, uh, concentrate his work on civilian and the military use of uh, nuclear energy. In 1983, he set up uh, WISE Paris. Uh, WISE is uh, World Informational Information Service on Energy. And that's uh, most of all these uh, essential issues in nuclear. Nuclear energy, military use, nuclear waste, uh, disposal, uh, all the information, almost all information you can find uh, in the uh, World Information Service on Energy. In 1992, Ms. Schneider uh, initiated the World Nuclear Industry Status Report and uh, updated several times to this date. And that's why, that's how I uh, knew Mr. Schneider. In 2004, the World uh, Nuclear Industry Status Report. In 1991, uh, he was invited by uh, Takagi, Mr. Takagi, to Japan about the plutonium issue. And uh, they worked together things. And uh, in 1997, uh, Mr. Schneider and Mr. Takagi received the Right Livelihood Award, uh, equivalent to Nobel Prize. They say alternative Nobel Prize. But I don't know how, how about the, uh, the awards <laughs> in terms of money. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's 60,000 euros now. Oh, that's not so bad. Yes. <laughs> and over the years, Mr. Schneider uh, gave lots of uh, uh, briefings and evidence to various uh, parliaments around the world. So uh, I think you gave a presentation yesterday. So it's our pleasure to have Mr. Schneider give us a report what happened uh, after Fukushima on the nuclear energy industry. That's what <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, what I will try to do with uh, this presentation really is uh, to give a historical perspective uh, on the industry as a whole. Uh, I, I believe, as a system analyst and an energy um, uh, professional, that it's it's very difficult to look at energy issues. Uh, in the short term. You need a long period, look at long period developments in order to understand uh, trends uh, and the significance of, of events. So I will uh, spend a lot of time looking at what happened before uh, 3.11 uh, in order to be able to judge what 3.11 had actually as an effect. Um, here we have the uh, Reactor startups and shutdowns. Startups are considered uh, uh, grid connections uh, in our definition. Uh, so we have basically, <clears throat> after a re relatively slow startup phase, two big waves of grid connections, one in the 1970s, one in the 1980s, and then a sort of a flat uh, development where shutdowns in red like red and green become sort of equivalent after uh, the end of the 1980s. So in cumulated ways, this looks like this. Uh, there was an uninterrupted rise of the numbers of reactors uh, until uh, 1989, and then uh, a, a flat uh, development, uh, no major uh, increase in the numbers. Uh, the, the historic peak was reached 10 years ago, in 2002. 
with 444 reactors. Uh, we now count uh, a total of 429 reactors. Now, uh, this figure uh, includes 10 Fukushima reactors that we took off the grid. Officially, uh, the Japanese government has shut down definitely only the four uh, units uh, number one to four of Fukushima Daiichi. Um, however, we consider it is, it is um, it, totally unrealistic to, to think of any of the Fukushima reactors to go back online. In fact, uh, it is even very unlikely that a lot of the other reactors go back online. So, but the situation is unclear. Uh, the Japanese government has not taken any clear decisions on a roadmap to close uh, uh, or restart reactors. So uh, what we did is we basically did several scenarios. Uh, you know that currently uh, there's only two reactors that generate electricity. So officially, if you go to the International Atomic Energy Agency's website, uh, and you click on Japan, it says 50 reactors in operation. Uh, in operation, people understand usually that they generate electricity, but they don't. The only two reactors that actually generate electricity currently is OV3 and 4. Uh, so how to judge the other reactors is kind of uh, difficult. So we created two scenarios. We said the East Coast scenario, under that term, we consider that the all the reactors impacted by 311 would not restart. So beyond the Fukushima reactors, it would be Onagawa, which is, was the closest to the epicenter. It would be Tokai, which is the closest to Tokyo, which is only about 100 kilometers from Tokyo. And Hamaoka, which was uh, shut down at the request of former Prime Minister um, Khan, uh, because they recalculated uh, earthquake uh, beyond design basis of earthquake probability at over 80% until 2030. So they thought, oh, maybe it's a better idea to keep them shut down. Um, so we consider that that is a credible minimum scenario, that these reactors will not restart. So that's seven more. Uh, another, uh, in another scenario, we, we, which we call the German scenario, we, we consider that all the units that are over uh, 30 years in age would not restart. That's exactly what the German government did after 311. They decided uh, on the on the single criteria of age to take off the grid uh, eight reactors uh, of 17 um, <clears throat> and shut them down for good. So we call it the East uh, the German scenario. So if you take two, that's another 12 units that would be taken off the grid. If you take two together, it would be 19 in addition. Uh, to be shut down. And again, I, I, I consider this relatively conservative because each single restart uh, uh, decision is raising huge opposition in Japan currently. So, so it is very, very um, difficult to, uh, to assess how many reactors will actually finally be able to restart. Uh, if it is these 19, it would bring the, the number down anywhere around uh, 410. Uh, so the, 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 the order of magnitude is around 400, uh, which brings us back to the late 1980s uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is a good illustration of what I'm trying to do. You can see that each figure can be debated. Each number can be debated. Is it 429, 410, 400? Uh, very difficult. However, the trend cannot be debated. The trend is very clear. Uh, and, and that's what I'm trying to do, is to, to assess the trend rather than, than the, uh, uh, the, the film, rather than the photograph, the momentary situ situation. The other level here is this line, this uh, orange line, which is the installed electricity generating capacity. And you can see that the, the, the form of the curve is, doesn't follow exactly the number of reactors. Uh, there is two reasons to this. New reactors that have replaced uh, shutdown reactors uh, in, in general were, were bigger reactors. 
reactors. So the, the capacity continued to increase with smaller numbers of reactors. And the second uh, level is, the second reason is uh, so-called uprating, um, which means by technical means you increase the installed capacity at an existing plant. Uh, it's, by the way, a very large spread practice. Uh, it's, it's like if you, if you put a turbo into a, a car, or you change you know, uh, the motor, or you increase the volume of the, of the cylinders. So you have artificial technical means to increase the capacity, existing capacity. And this can be very much. It can be over 20% increase in, in, in capacity. Uh, which interestingly raises, of course, uh, safety issues that have never been subject to any kind of public debate. Now, uh, in the absence of, of large spread new build programs, uh, the, the uh, age, the specific age of the operating nuclear reactors basically gains a year every year. Um, we have currently uh, 20 reactors that have been operating for over 40 years, but we have 155 that have been operating over 30 years. Now, some of you might be old enough to remember the cars in the streets 30 years ago. Um, they looked a little bit different from today's cars, right? I mean, it's really old technology. Even on average, uh, we're, we're talking now about a reactor park fleet in the world that is uh, uh, seven, 27 years old. Um, <clears throat> and we, we see that these, you know, we have these two construction waves. This is the construction wave, startup wave from the 70s that moves now towards, you know, towards the 40-year level. And we have a much bigger wave yet from the, from the 1980s that is moving, you know, towards, towards older operating, operating now, that is the same picture as we've seen on, from the worldwide scale, but in, in this case, it is concentrating on the European Union, the 27 countries of the European Union. Uh, and we see the same kind of pattern, uh, increased pattern, uh, until the, the, the end of the 1980s, as in the worldwide scale. However, uh, already in, in uh, 1988, it reached the historic peak, right? Uh, with 177 reactors. And from then on, we have a declining trend. So, Fukushima is not a trigger of uh, the declining trend. Fukushima is an accelerator of the declining trend. That's very important to understand. Uh, people, many people had the impression that there was this kind of blooming industry. Uh, uh, the, the, the industry nuclear industry propaganda has put out for 10 years the term of a nuclear renaissance. Um, in fact, this renaissance, as you can see, statistically, never happened. It never took place. So th this impression of people that it was like kind of a skyrocketing uh, industry and that had, you know, is now in trouble through this accident uh, in, in Japan is, is historically not true. Uh, the, the situation now is that we have, in, in, in total, 45 reactors less operating than in 1988 in Europe. 45 less. So if you read in a newspaper that there is a reactor under construction in Finland and another one in France, uh, so it looks like it's still you know, ongoing, uh, it, it doesn't change in any means the overall trend. It doesn't even recover you know, the shutdowns that, that we can expect uh, even before those two reactors will eventually go online. So the trend continues and rather accelerating, in spite of the fact that one or the other plant might be constructed. Um, <clears throat> we've seen numbers of reactors, startups, shutdowns, uh, and we've seen electricity generating capacity. This is electricity generation, so it's electricity production by nuclear power over the past 20 years. And you see it's been increasing for the reasons we've seen. Uh, although the stagnating, we had a stagnating number of units operating, but an increase in capacity so that the, the electricity production 
continued to increase until a historic peak in 2006. And again, we have a decline since then. And the, the, I mean, this drop between 2010 and 2011 is obviously linked to, to 3.11. Uh, and essentially based on, on uh, production reductions in Japan, Germany, and the United States. It doesn't really translate. This actually doesn't really translate a world uh, trend. It's uh, the drop, the significant, significant drop in three countries that, that led to that significant uh, phenomenon. But the, the overall trend we had is already, it's just another trend, an acceleration of the trend, including in production. If we look at the relative share of uh, nuclear power in the overall electricity generation, so the role nuclear power plays in the, in the in, uh, energy landscape, uh, the, and this was really even surprising to me, who's been working on this for a long time, the historic maximum was actually already reached in 1993, almost 20 years ago, so it was 17%. And then we have this, this, this decline, although the, 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 <coughs> the production continued to increase, the relative share declined so slowly over the past, the entire past 20 years. In other words, uh, other uh, electricity generating uh, technologies have had a much higher uh, rate of increase uh, than, than nuclear power. So the, the relative share has been, has been going down for a long time. Um, yes, and the current number is approximately 11% uh, of the electricity. Now, who is generating nuclear electricity? There's 31 countries. First phenomenon, which is easy to see. Uh, again, I'm interested more in the relative shares than, uh, like, in the shape of the graphs rather than the absolute numbers. It's, it's very evident that it's not like a spread out phenomenon over over 30 countries. It's very much concentrated on a very small number of countries. It's like you have two countries that generate. Uh, uh, almost uh, half of the nuclear electricity in the world, the U.S. and France. France alone generates half of Europe's uh, nuclear electricity. So, uh, it, it's again, it's not a spread out phenomenon. Also, the, the other thing which is interesting, if you, if you look for, for some countries like, like India, um, Belgium, you know, tiny Belgium generates more nuclear electricity than China, uh, than India, yeah. right? Uh, so it's not about size neither. Uh, when you look at China too, Ukraine generates more uh, nuclear electricity than, than, than mainland China. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it's highly concentrated, and for the 2012 figures, this is 2011, we, we can expect another very substantial drop in Japan and and Germany, because of the events of, of Fukushima. Uh, now looking, looking forward, this is like the, the, the historic uh, perspective, and status looking forward um, uh, is, the, the, the first criteria to look at is reactors under construction. Now we always use under construction in quotation marks, because it's like in operation, it's a matter of definition. Uh, under construction, you would consider it's a project that from the point, there is a point of start of construction to grid connection. That, that would be like under construction. However, there's many, many projects that have never been actually finished. Uh, in the U.S., uh, if you look at reactor orders, more orders have been canceled than, than actually carried out. Uh, so... Uh, units under construction don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean they, are, they will actually be connected to the grid. Maybe you have a similar situation uh, soon with uh, React uh, uh, num uh, plant number four. Um, <clears throat> uh, the latest example, by the way, is, uh, is uh, two reactors that were in the statistics as under construction for 25 years, two reactors in Bulgaria. And they've been simply dropped. 
right? abandoned. Two, two reactors under construction for 25 years, simply abandoned. Because it just doesn't make any, any economic sense. So <clears throat> we see that the, the other point, which is very, uh, very important here, is the, the relative significance of the current number of reactors uh, under construction. It's a kind of typical example. If, if you show, if I had decided to just show the last seven years, right, you would see a significant increase, like a doubling of the number of uh, reactors uh, under construction. Well, it wouldn't, that's the kind of thing that the nuclear industry loves to do, right? It shows the, the increasing trend. It doesn't give you the historical perspective. But if you, if you look at the actual number of units under construction in 2005, you realize this was the lowest number of units under construction since the beginning of the nuclear age in the 1950s, right? So it was a really very low number, which which by no means allowed to, to even maintain the current numbers of reactors uh, in operation. So yes, it increased from there, but compared to the, to the historic peaks, it's a very low, it remains a very low number. Now who is building? Um, again, we have a situation that is not spread out over a large number of countries. Uh, it's uh, one country, uh, China, builds 40%, has 40% of all reactors uh, that are in the statistics as under construction. Uh, and there's only uh, Russia, India, and South Korea that have more than two reactors uh, under, under construction. Uh, so it's highly concentrated uh, it's, uh, in, in uh, this, this region. Uh, the second uh, uh, point which is remarkable is that when you could look at construction start, dates. You yeah, have some amazing uh, dates here, like 85, 85. Uh, Taiwan obviously is, is amongst the long-lasting construction sites, 86, 81. And uh, the record plant is, is in the U.S. Uh, construction start 1972. I always think, you know, that this should be the subject of a doctoral thesis, you know, this project. <laughs> Uh, and there could be one, uh, you know, in an industry department, one uh, on, in politic, politics department, uh, you know, and one uh, that, that really looks at the history uh, of decision making. Um, financial, the financing costs of that project would be probably uh, beyond uh, imagination. Um, 40 years of construction. And then the startup date here that, is, that has been the great connection uh, somebody uh, told me the other day, this is misleading, and it's true. It should be grid connection, it should be planned grid connection, right? Because it moves. This is only current dates that, that, are, uh, um, that are put forward by, by the operators uh, or the planners. Uh, this date is already outdated. Like, the current estimate is 2015 or 2016. So... Isn't that amazing? After 40 years, you know, they're still incapable of, uh, you know, planning ahead uh, to finishing off this plant uh, on time and on budget. Because, of course, the budget has since, you know, skyrocketed again, you know, for I don't know how many times now this has, has actually happened. Uh, so this is why we keep this, you know, under construction in quotation marks, uh, to be a little careful. Um, we have been uh, looking, uh, this is my favorite slide uh, of this series, um, <clears throat> we have been looking at the, the development of uh, construction times. Um, and <clears throat> so every dot is the average construction time of reactors that came online, were connected to the grid, that given year. Okay? And the size of the balls indicate the numbers of reactors. And it's very interesting because it really shows that there is a clear pattern. Uh, you know, larger numbers of reactors uh, until the uh, end of the 1980s. Same kind of pattern. You, you found a pattern until the end of the 1980s. Uh, and after, it's like an explosion. It's like anarchy. 
no rules to the game anymore. Right? Uh, you want a high number? Well, you, you get one. You want a low number? Well, you get one the next year. You know? It's a, something for everybody. Uh, but there's no, no pattern anymore. Uh, it, it's remarkable, though, that, that how high this, these, these numbers actually go. It's like 14 years with the, the, the average of the, the uh, last year's uh, uh, grid connections. The, this, this dot here is, is also very remarkable. It's two units that came online in 2012 in, in South Korea. And in fact, it was 4.4 years average construction time, which is absolutely stunning. Uh, I've tried to find out why. You know, how do they do this? Uh, and I've discussed this with, you know, nuclear industry people from Korea, with uh, policymakers, and nobody can really explain how they do this. I mean, you know, why are they so fast? You know, I mean, what makes them so fast? Maybe they, their engineers are particularly, you know, intelligent or so, or a good planet, I don't know. But it's, it's very surprising to, to, to find this low number. Um, However, it, it, it was the only country that actually connected new reactors to the grid in, in 2012. No other country did. Uh, and uh, China neither, by the way. Uh, so, uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the lessons, though, which is very clear, is that you have an increasing trend of, of construction time. A very clear trend uh, over the years. Which obviously leads to, to increased costs. Now a bit a bit on on economics, uh, talking about cost. These are typical uh, technology learning curves. Um, again, I'm not interested in the in the figures, absolute figures, uh, and they're already outdated. Actually, what I'm, the only thing I'm trying to demonstrate is that the pattern of the decline in specific electricity generating costs uh, for uh, renewable energy technology and this is the kind of technology learning curve that you can find for, for any technology, not only energy technology. It's, it's very simple. With innovation, with uh, you know, um, uh, reduced costs by numbers and experience, uh, specific uh, costs go down. It's nothing, nothing surprising. Uh, what is more surprising is to see the nuclear learning curve. Um, you know, we call it a negative learning curve. Uh, uh, one analyst, a colleague, has called this forgetting by doing. <laughs> I like that. It's kind of nice. So uh, you, you can look at the, the, the American example. was actually from the database. It's uh, the best that exists. But uh, I think it's um, the, the most interesting is to look at the French because the French are considered like nuclear dreamland. Right? It's like... The, the conditions to build nuclear power plants are optimum in, in France. Decade-long support uh, for the uh, nuclear industry, you know, never a doubt about uh, continuous uh, uh, planning and building. And, and still, and still, you find a very clear increasing trend. And the most expensive uh, uh, investment was the latest reactor that came online in, in 1996. So uh, even the, the, the most nuclear country and the, where the conditions are I ideal, we have this huge uh, uh, cost increase. Now, this is empirical of the, the latest unit that came online. We have, uh, uh, obviously, a few reactors that are, that are under construction. And the, the model that is being promoted by, by the French, is actually developed by the, uh, uh, the French and the German, is the EPR, the, the Euro European Pressurized Water Reactor. In, in the U.S. it's called the Evolutionary Pressurized Water Reactor. Uh, we call it the European Problem Reactor. Um, the, the, the cost uh, estimates for uh, an EPR have increased by a factor of over four over the past ten years. What we did here is we, we looked at historical references from French government or the, the EDF, the state utility, or the builder, Arriva, uh, government, EDF, Cour des Comptes is the uh, uh, court of accounts, 
uh, and the um, and EF as the latest estimate. And you, you see that even if you deflate uh, to 2012 euros, uh, the increase is of over a factor of four. This is a huge increase over you know a relatively small period of time for a project like this. Ten years is uh, less than the lead time for a project. And it's very important to understand that these estimates were actually uh, leading to project decisions, right? I mean, those were the figures that were, were given out prior to the decision to start construction. So they actually are underlying political decision making. And it's important to understand this, that, that you know, it just never, uh, it never came true. This is, this is like a, uh, has been repeated over and over in history that the, the original project estimates have nothing to do with reality. They, they always increase cost by, by a, a very significant margin. Um, we try to understand, too, what, what, uh, you know, how are, what is the economic and financial situation of uh, nuclear, major nuclear companies. This is the first time we do this analysis, and it was really fascinating. Now, in order to to judge how uh, companies' uh, stock value, which is like one, one criterion amongst others, but how, how it plays out. What we did is we took the, the Financial Times Stock Exchange Index from the UK uh, and placed a 100-100 index in, in, at the beginning of 2007. Obviously, you cannot just look at the, how, how a company performs on the stock exchange because all the companies have suffered in a major economic crisis like 2008-2009. So one has to look at how specific companies perform against you know, average performance. And one can take any index. We chose to, to, to take the, the, the London one. Uh, and if you, if you look, it's the gray line here. It, you know, all the companies suffered severely you know, in, in the crisis. They went up almost like, lost almost half. Uh, of its value, but it, it came back up to a level which is very similar to what it was in, in early 2007. Now, <clears throat> if you look at, at uh, major utilities, only one has done better than, uh, than the stock exchange uh, in London, it's Scottish Electric. Uh, incidentally, it's, uh, it's one of the utilities that have actually withdrawn from a nuclear new build in, in, in the UK. Now, if one looks at the other ones from the bottom, the dark blue is TEPCO. Um, uh, there, the, the, the impact of uh, 3.11 is uh, pretty dramatic, right? And pretty obvious and pretty logical. However, you know, again, we see that, you know, even before TEPCO had already, you know, TEPCO's performance was far from brilliant. You know, it's not that that TEPCO was in big crisis only because of, uh, because of the Fukushima uh, uh, events. Uh, now, th this, this decline here is, is roughly 94%, up to 94% of, of the value of the, the TEPCO stocks. And it's important to understand that TEPCO's uh, shares were considered by the Japanese as very secure investment. Uh, Maybe not very high dividends, but very secure. So, so many even modest people that had a few shares and you know and put uh, put aside some savings had Tepco shares because that was the reputation. It's safe, right? I mean, these people lost all their money, ninety-five percent, you know, of their money, uh, which is which to many mo even modest households was dramatic. Uh, more surprising, though, is, is to find a company like Arriva, uh, which is the largest nuclear builder in the world, the largest nuclear fuel company in the world, uh, that lost up to, like, between the peak it had in, in 2007 and the lowest level in 2012, it lost up to 88% of its value. 88%. It's a uh, state-owned, 85% state-owned uh, uh, French company. Uh, because of various reasons, because of mismanagement, because of the problem uh, reactor in Finland, where they, they lost at least 
uh, 3 billion euros just, just in this one uh, project um, <clears throat> uh, because of misinvestments uh, in, in uranium and other issues. But again, it's the same, <coughs> same pattern. The, the, you know, it's a company that well, was already under stress uh, pre-Fukushima and then, and then plunged uh, after that. Uh, particularly, but it was this was not triggered by Fukushima, and the state utility EDF uh, lost equally up to eighty-two uh, percent, and and with a similar similar pattern that started way before. The other criteria we looked at is credit rating. Now, credit rating is is um, uh, obviously a criteria which is uh, absolutely key for investment costs for companies. Uh, if the, the better the credit rating, the lower the, the, the cost of loans and, and, and credits, and the easier you get them. Um, we took Standard & Poor's. Um, Standard & Poor's uh, best note is a AAA. Uh, there's no AAA. Um, but there was a double A. You know, TEPCO at the time was the only double A. Uh, so it was also considered by the, by the credit rating agencies and by the financial institutions as a very secure and safe investment. Uh, well, it, it's not anymore, right? I mean, it turned to junk uh, quite immediately uh, after 3.11. Arriva is, is now uh, only one notch above junk uh, level. In, in, in fact, uh, if you look, Standard & Poor's does a global note and they do a what is called a standalone credit profile. So they look at the performance of the company, uh, uh, not taken into account in the global note the context in which the company uh, evolves. Uh, in, in, the, in, in this case, in France, it's a company that is, has a very significant state support. You know, it's considered that the French state would not let go a company like Arriva bankrupt. So uh, they they uh, they get uh, additional three notches by Standard and Poor's uh, for extraordinary state support. Three minutes? I thought forty minutes is my was my. <laughs> Yeah, but I was given 40 minutes, no? Was that a misunderstanding? I, I'm exactly at 34 minutes. So I have my, I have a count of it. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll speed up. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the, the, the actual uh, standalone credit profile of of uh, uh, Arriva is already in junk and is only one notch above what is called highly speculative. The largest nuclear builder, the largest nuclear fuel company in the world. Now, <clears throat> uh, we have tried to look at what kind of uh, effects or what, what happens in terms of uh, investments. In, in, on one hand, on, in nuclear power, but to compare it with renewable energy. And the, the result is pretty amazing. Uh, you see growth rates for renewable energy investment uh, over 20% over, over longer periods of time. Uh, like between 2004 and 2011, uh, renewable energy investments have increased by a factor of 10. Uh, there's no figures for nuclear investments. What we did is we, we basically uh, considered a construction start with an, um, an estimated investment cost for a project and applied it to a given, to the startup year, which obviously doesn't really reflect reality because the expenditure is spread out over, over uh, uh, many years. But it's to simplify and to get a sort of an or vague order of magnitude. So in, in reality, this curve would be much flatter than it, 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 uh, it is expressed here. But you can already see the huge difference between investment in, in renewable energies and, and nuclear power. 
who is investing in renewables? Uh, China was, was number one over the past uh, few years, uh, but like China in 2010, again, this is pre-Fukushima, right? But China invested in 2010 more than the entire world in 2004. That sort of you know, gives an idea of the, the, the trends and the dynamic and the trends in the sector. However, what is interesting is that the U.S. took over the lead uh, in, in 2011, and not many people talk about the U.S. when they think about renewable energy, right? Where people think more about Germany or, or other European countries. Uh, there's new players, like Italy went from 6 to 28 billion uh, euros investment uh, in, in, in one year. So there, there's a, the, the, the dynamic for certain countries is really quite incredible. Uh, the grid connections are accordingly uh, increasing vastly here in wind, in, in solar uh, uh, installed capacity. Uh, this is on the world scale. Uh, in Europe, uh, the wind, wind and solar photovoltaics together, over a 10-year period, uh, outpaces now natural gas. Uh, whereas nuclear power, in terms of capacity, has joined the ranks of uh, you know, phasing out technologies like coal and, and, and fuel oil. Uh, let me say, uh, just uh, uh, there's more information country by country, and a lot of it has been translated into Chinese. So maybe you can circulate that, that after. Is that possible? I'll put it on the website or so. Put that up. Um, <clears throat> So just, just on China, just uh, uh, to finish off, um, because it's really the, the, the only country that has been uh, uh, massively investing in, in uh, new nuclear power projects. However, uh, China uh, is also the country where, which reacted one of the first ones to freeze uh, um, new, con new construction sites. So there were a lot, of, a lot more sites that should have started up over the past uh, year and a half. And there's not a single new nuclear construction site that has been opened since we left. Not one. And there's two reactors that came online in 2011. That's about 1,600 megawatts. However, that's, uh, you know, they put up more than 10 times more wind power uh, alone. 10 times more in one year. Um, Solar, the addition rate has increased by a factor of five in 2011 compared to 2010. So again, a very uh, sharp increase with a target that quadrupled uh, um, for 2015. And now the big question is, will China build, uh, continue to build its standard generation two reactor? And it's now increasingly clear they won't. So, they will, there will be another delay until the Generation 3 reactors are, are ready. So, I will jump to the conclusion. Uh, uh, overall, the nuclear power uh, plays a very limited role, 11% of electricity, less than 5% of commercial primary energy, and maybe, you know, nobody knows exactly, of course, but less than 2% of, of final energy. So, it's, it's you know, on, on a global scale, it's very, very small. Uh, it, it's obvious that, that the Fukushima effect will have a negative impact on costs because of safety, insurance, financing, and a lot of other problems that, that, um, that are linked. And we've seen that the companies themselves are in big trouble. Um, I, I think it's clear now that there, as a, as a general trend, there is no long-term perspective uh, for nuclear power in the world. And that with the, with the upcoming uh, change, systemic changes in storage uh, options, uh, technologies, and um, uh, grid developments, that this, this will continue to uh, uh, boost uh, renewable energy uh, development. Well, thank you very much for your attention.